So we're going to start off uh, more of a vascular uh, discussion, cardiology talking, and that's going to be uh, venous thromboembolism prevention across the continuum applications of clinical evidence for extended prophylaxis from inpatient to outpatient care. Obviously, for those of us working in health systems and so forth, understand how significant this disease state can be and how disastrous this can be, whether it be a post-operative complication or, in this case, just for the patient who's under general medicine care, who's at risk, unfortunately, of developing one of these events. With us today is one of the preeminent experts in uh, venous thromboembolic disease. That's Dr. Mark Munger. He's professor of pharmacotherapy, as well as adjunct professor in internal medicine and associate dean of college affairs at the College of Pharmacy at the University of Utah Health Sciences Center. Dr. Munger, um, he received his Bachelor of Science in Pharmacy at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, but more importantly, received his Doctor of Pharmacy at the uh, University of Illinois in Chicago, Illinois. He completed a cardiovascular pharmacotherapy research fellowship at Case Western Reserve University and the University of Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, was recently speaking at Harvard yesterday on ways that pharmacists can now be integrated into far more significant areas in cardiovascular disease than we ever have. So with this, it is just an absolute honor today to introduce Dr. Mark Munger. Good morning. Um, so let's go back. What I want to do is really spend the next 40 minutes with you talking a little bit about something new in VTE treatment. Those of you that work in anticoag treatment centers or uh, referral centers, I think probably realize that we've done a great deal of work on the outpatient setting in anticoag, but the transition of care from the inpatient to the outpatient arena has been not as well developed, and what I want to do is share with you the background data for that, and then suggest to you that there may be a new drug, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to make formulary decisions with this. So I have no financial disclosures, and what I want to do with the learning objectives is the following. I want to talk a little bit about the clinical and economic burdens associated with VTE patients admitted with, and this is the important part, acute medical illness. We're not going to really focus so much on cancer and cancer treatments that relate to VTE, the development of VTE, but we're going to focus on acute medical illnesses in the hospital and then how do those transition out. Describe the standard of care for VTE prophylaxis and then evaluate the latest clinical evidence associated with the use of DOAX for both acute and extended prophylaxis. And then what I want to do is offer you the last two bullet points, which is give you some risk stratification and patient-specific factors to help you with formulary decisions if you haven't already made a formulary decision about this area of treatment. And then the last one is to encourage you all to really get involved in interdisciplinary teams if you haven't on transition of care and show you some positive evidence of pharmacists being enrolled in interdisciplinary care for transitions of care from the inpatient to outpatient setting. So what I want to talk about a little bit, of uh, those of you that don't work in cardiology or don't work in thrombosis, then actually recognizing the importance of VTE as really as a major public health care crisis is important. Deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism represent a major public health problem with a significant human and economic toll on the nation. This was from 2008. I'll show you the data, and you can determine whether you think the U.S. Surgeon General is correct. And one in four people worldwide dies of conditions caused by thrombosis worldwide. It is the leading cause of global death and disability by the World Thrombosis Day. So at least by those two quotes, we see that this has significant impact on our practices as we move forward. So what is this burden of illness with VTE? So let's start at the top of this graph. This is G7 countries, um, mostly in Europe and the United States. How big is the at-risk population of acutely medical Ill, uh, medically ill patients annually? Approximately 24 million patients uh, worldwide are, uh, are hospitalized due to acutely ill medical patients. And then of those, about one-tenth one-tenth are at risk of a VTE event, and about one million VTE events occur in those, pa in those patient populations. 
So one million events of VTE are occurring. And of those, there is a sudden impact that can occur in many of these of 150,000 deaths occur annually from VTE. Often those are sudden deaths. So let's compare this to other disease states that are very well known to you. Looking at colon cancer, influenza, pneumonia, diabetes coming from the CDC or the Office of the Surgeon General. If we compare those, what we see is that more attributable annual U.S. deaths occur from VTE than, comp than compared to ones that get far more press and are far more publicized with, uh, within our own disciplines. More 100,000 confirmed deaths in the United States. Next, VTE is often a silent killer, meaning the first event that occurs can lead to sudden death. Um, often the first symptom of VTE is a fatal PE, and this can occur in up to one quarter of the patients that experience a, v, uh, experience a PT, PE. Acutely medical ill patients, this is your, in the orange is the answer to your first question. Acutely ill medical patients have an eight times higher risk of VTE versus the general population. An eight times higher risk of VTE. And a notice that it's acutely ill medical patients have a eight times higher risk. Okay. So what I want to do is digress for just a few minutes and show you some research we've done in VTE at the University of Utah, led by Mike Fian and Dan Witt, and I was a participant in this research. So it was a two-year program. Um, initial qualitative interviews were done with actual VTE patients to inform a nationwide survey instrument. And then that national survey instrument was sent out to 1,000 patients around the United States. And then we used that instrument to inform our anti-coag clinic of changes that we need to make in the treatment that we were offering through the anti-coag clinic. I'll show you what that, what that change was. And we did pre- and post-evaluations of our thrombosis services at the University of Utah. So the research objectives in the box, the primary objective was to build a novel patient-centric statistical model of factors driving success as well as adversity in VTE care across the United States. The mo model will ultimately be used, as I said, to identify potential VTE care, interve care intervention targets that we used in our thrombosis clinic. Online survey of 971 patients with VT in the United States was conducted in 2016. He had to be 18 years of age, experienced at least one VTE event in the last two years. Patients with cancer-related VTE were not included because the pathogenesis of cancer-related VTE, usually related to treatment, is different than the pathogenesis occurs in, med in um, medical patients. Um, quotas for patients with VTE were set up to allow adequate representation within subgroups of interest, and we ended up with 907 patients after we cleaned the data for nonsensical responses. And here's the background. This is primarily a middle-aged, um, two, two, uh, approximately two-thirds were female versus um, males, uh, primarily Caucasian. Uh, comorbidity index was 3.32, so a relatively moderately based comorbidity index. 27% had anxiety. About the same number had asthma, COP, and depression and heart disease. About half had hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia was seen in about 40% of patients. What I want you to call your attention to, though, is the bottom part of the slide. Notice that once you have a first VTE event, your likelihood of having more is very common, including two-thirds of patients that have three or, more, or two or more VTE events. That is incredibly important, both from a treatment standpoint, as well as I'll show you a psychological standpoint in the next few slides. So let's look at this high emotional impact. The emotional impact of VTE occurs in all stages of their journey including the first time they hear about the fact they had a VTE through the treatment phase and through long-term follow-up. And we asked them to tell us what animal they would project thinking about what VTE meant in their lives. And that animal, as you can see, was either a snake or was a bear. And their comments were, I was terrified. It almost died 
the day before because it was deeply traumatic to me. And number two, I sought help, help for stress management adjusted to health changes. And many patients, as I'll show you, end up with depression because of VTE. So it comes as a follow-up of having a long-term, essentially, if you will, chronic disease. And we often don't think of VTE as a chronic disease. So this is looking at patients' fear of future clots. What you can see is about one in 10 patients nationwide are fearing of a second clot. In Utah, it was slightly higher, and we had our own cohort in, in uh, their anticoagulation um, treatment arm, but about one in 10. And if you look at the HADS index, which is a hospital anxiety and depression scale, again, it looks like it's about one in 10 that are abnormal both from a national standpoint and from a local standpoint in the state of Utah. So factoring into you, those of you that work in anticoagulation clinics, factoring into the fact that those patients have a high degree of anxiety and a high degree of depression, that's how we made changes in our anticoag clinic. And we asked a series of very simple questions. And if they answered those questions in a manner that suggested they had anxiety and depression related to their VTE, they're actually uh, referred on to our social department and our psychiatry department to help them with their treatment. Okay, what are the emotional harms? Another fear of a uh, high fear of another clot, poor health literacy, multiple comorbidities, and then factors that patients that are not normal are having trouble getting access to the system or maintaining access to the system are much more fearful of having a clot than those that have an easier time ma manipulating through the system. Those include being non-white, non poor health locus of control, um, and then the ones you see at the very bottom, which are barriers to care, paying for health care, paying for their medications, transportation, or social issues of taking care of their children or loved ones at home when they need to go for care. All right, so what's the cost of VTE? Now to regress back to the, away from our study, about 6.7 to 9.8 B billion dollars per year, okay? Direct medical costs are about, interestingly, are about 11 to 15, but notice what occurs. We think of VTE as an acute event, so therefore we would suspect, as we do with having a surgical intervention, that our first year costs are pretty high and then they diminish after time of having our surgical event. That is not true of VTE. You can see that the costs actually go up over time as the complications from VTE occur. All right, so who are the at-risk patients? 55% are medical patients. About 45% are surgical patients. So essentially, it's a 50-50 split between medical and surgical patients. Probably, if you don't take anything else away from this, take this slide home. This is your thought about the, really the background of thinking about VTE. Three factors are very important. If that patient remains immobile, after their hospitalization or in, during their hospitalization for a prolonged period of time. If they have a hypercoagulable state, either due to genetics or due to the background of the current disease that they have that contributes to coagulation, and finally, inflammation. And we could argue easily that almost all disease states that we have within a hospital have some component of inflammation. But if you have those three factors, immobility, hypercoagulable state and inflammation, those are the patients that are at risk, okay? That includes cancer, infections, respiratory disease, inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic strokes, all non-surgical patients, rheumatology disorders, and heart failure. All those have a component of one, two, or all three of these factoring into why they're at risk of VTE events. But let's focus on maybe the most important of the three, and that's immobility. Immobility can continue for weeks after hospitalization, as many of you know, especially in the patients that have had multiple comorbidities or multiple reasons for being admitted to the hospital. And as we have shortened our hospital stays, what has happened to what happened, where do patients go? They go home. Now they're often going to long-term extended care facilities often which do not get patients up and mobile very quickly. 
and acute medical illnesses also flare up or exacerbations require rehospitalization, further contributing to the immobilization of patients. So getting patients up, getting, patient, getting physical therapy involved early with these patients becomes very important just to keep blood flow going and stopping the venous stasis that can contribute to VTE. All right, let me set the slide, set this slide for you. It's relatively busy. What we're looking at is in hospitalized, acutely medical ill patients, more than half of the VT events occur within 30 days. If you're looking on the right-hand side of the um, y-axis, what you see is a cumulative probability of VTE over the total period of 180 days. And then 180-day probability of, in a percentage is given to you on the left axis, on the left y-axis, and the x-axis is days after initial hospitalization. The yellow is the mean hospitalization from this study. It was about five days. But the orange is the risk of a VTE event post-hospitalization. And what you see is that the vast majority of this, about 50% of this, occurs after the patient leaves the hospital, but within the first 30 to 35 days after the hospital. So the take-home message here is that patients, yes, are clearly at risk of a VTE event in the hospital, but also that risk continues potentially to a higher rate and within the first 30 days post-hospitalization. So who are the patients? So let's put this into a Venn diagram, and we'll look at the th on the right-hand side, age greater than 75 years of age. And I'll show you that these patients are at the greater risk due to all three of those categories that we talked about before. And then reduced mobility, other risk factors, including an elevator D-dimer, which is our laboratory interpretation of a hypercoagulable state, renal impairment, prior VTE, or other reasons. And if you put all those together, you end up with that, the middle of this Venn diagram, which is high-risk patients with total about 7.7 .7 million U.S. patients on an annual basis. This is on an annual basis. So again, age greater than 75, reduced mobility, laboratory-based risk uh, using a D-dimer for a hypercoagulable state, renal impairment, prior VTE, or other. All right, so let's look at the unmet need then based on that background of those types of patients that are at risk. So first of all, there are four studies that have been done. And what I've done for you is tried to simplify those studies down to benefit and risk of those studies. So the first one is called the EXCLAIM trial. It was done in two, published in 2010 and enrolled 6,000 patients. And this was versus placebo for anoxaparin over a 14-day period. It reduced VTE to a barely significant um, issue of 0.04, but it increased bleeding. So there was no further research done on anoxaparin in the post-VTE prophylaxis state. Next one is a, the ADOPT study, Apixaban. By the way, those of you that work in cardiology and have done clinical trials realize that if you don't have an acronym for your study and you stay up all night trying to think of what those acronyms are, you can't get it published. So all of the, you'll see that all cardiology studies have some acronym. ADOPT was done in 2011. This was a comparison trial of Apixaban versus an active control anoxaparin over 14 days and then extended over 42 days after that. No difference in VTE with increased bleeding. So a pixaban was dropped from further study. And then you have two studies more recently with rivaroxaban, the Magellan study, which used rivaroxaban at 10 milligrams a day uh, versus anoxapirin as an active control in 8,000 patients. There was a statistically significant reduced VTE but with increased bleeding. And so they took, the, they took the rivaroxaban, decreased the dose from 10 milligrams to 7.5 milligrams. And the Mariner study, unfortunately, showed, showed the same thing. And that is a reduced VTE, which was not statistically significant, with increased bleeding. So we are left now that with no agents that demonstrate efficacy in this field. And the guidelines say in orange, guidelines do not recommend extended duration prophylaxis. 
for acutely ill medical patients because clinical trials have failed to identify a, a safe post-discharge treatment. So that leaves us with the APEX trial. And what I want to do is just present this to you. I'm not going to give you my bias associated with this. I want you to just decide based on this trial, is this an agent that you should be adding to your formulary for post-VTE um, um, care in the extended period? So the APEX trial objective was the following. To demonstrate the efficacy, safety, and efficacy of in-hospital during those five days, either starting it there or starting it immediately on discharge, extended duration over 30 to 42 days after the hospitalization, anticoagulation with the new DOAC called Betrexaban. I'll show you the difference, both PK and PD, in just a minute between this agent and the other DOACs, which are more, I think, you've uh, worked with for longer periods of time. Compared with standard of care anticoagulation with anoxaparin for 6 to 14 days, followed by placebo for prevention of VTE in acutely ill medical patients. So here's the comparison of Betrexaban. It's in the orange um, box here to compare it to the other DOACs that you're more familiar with, Dibigatron, uh, Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, and Doxaban. It also is a direct 10A inhibitor. It's Tmax, which is the third line down, is, is about twice as long. So it's indwelling Tmax is twice as long as we see with the other agents. And it's half-life is also twice as long. So this is a true once a day, a true once a day uh, DOAC. It uh, does, uh, does, not, does not undergo cytochrome P450 metabolism but it does have the same drug interactions that we see with the other drugs when it comes to P-glycoprotein. So drugs like verapamil, drugs like uh, amiodarone are clearly important drugs here that you will see in combination that may be drug interactions with this agent. Uh, protein binding is about the same, but notice under renal elimination. Under renal elimination, this drug is far less renally eliminated than any of the other drugs that we have available to us at only 11%, which allows us to use this drug down to creatinine clearances of 15 mils per minute. Two other points. One, that this drug needs to be taken with food every day. Although there are positives on the previous slide, I would not call this a positive as far as taking the drug, but it linked, the reason that the manufacturer has decided to do this is to maintain consistent levels of the drug, so it should be taken with food each day. And number two is the bottom part, and that is the prophylactic 42-day cost is $600. So um, in, a, in, a, in a day and age where we see huge amounts of money being delivered for drugs, this is a relatively reasonable amount of um, co cost compared to what we see with others. Okay, so let's continue. Patients included. They were included with heart failure in the APEX trial, respiratory failure, infectious disease, rheumatic disease, or ischemic strokes. You were eligible to be in this trial by one of three arms. The first one is, if you were over the age of 75, you immediately were allowed to be in the trial without any other factors. Number, arm number two, if you were 40, 60 to 74, you had to have two additional risk factors, which are lo located on the far right-hand side of the bottom part of the slide. Or you had to have a D-dimer of two times the upper limit of normal. That's our laboratory evaluation of hypercoagulability. Third group, 40 to 59-year-olds, so nobody under the age of 40 was enrolled in the trial. History of VTE or history of cancer plus one additional risk factor or a D-dimer, two times the upper limit of normal. The additional risk factors included previous VTE, history of heart failure in functional class three or four, concomitant acute infections, obesity with a BMI greater than 35, history of cancer, thrombophilia, concurrent use of erythropoiesis stimulating agents, or hormonal therapy. Okay, exclusion. Essentially, the key factor here is the first one. This is the only trial across all of the DOAC trials that have been done that took creatinine clearances down to 15 mils per minute. Uh, if you were below 15, you couldn't get in the trial, but between 15 and 30, you were eligible for the trial. 
And then the rest of it is really about the factors of all of you would think of when giving a DOAC and increasing the risk of bleeding. Anything that increased the risk of bleeding concomitantly with giving the DOAC was an exclusion cr criteria for the study. Okay, here is the background of how the trial was designed. Enrollment was 7,500 patients, and then they were randomized in a double-blind, double-dummy type of situation. So, those, the, so for 42 days, every patient got a pill, whether it was placebo or whether it was the active batrixaban, and every patient got an injection, sub-Q injection of batrixaban, of um, anoxapirin or placebo for the entire time. So randomization occurred to anoxapirin 40 milligrams sub-Q daily or to a loading dose of atrexaban at 160 milligrams followed by an 80 milligram oral daily dose. The anoxapirin um, arm after 14 days was stopped and they were given a placebo injection similar to what was being given in the batrexaban arm. This lasted for 42 days, and then the primary endpoint was assessed at 47 days, 32 to 47 days, with a follow-up safety visit at 65 to 77 days, and I'll show you why they did the safety visit in just a minute. If you had renal insufficiency below 15, you were given batrexaban 40 milligrams with a loading dose of 80, or if you had a concomitant P-glycoprotein inhibitor that could not be stopped for enrollment in the trial, you were also given 40 milligrams. Primary efficacy endpoint was a composite of VTE-related death, non-fatal PE, and asymptomatic proximal DVT or symptomatic DVT. And the primary safety endpoint at the bottom of the slide was bleeding through seven days after the patient discontinued from the study. And I'll show you that data on both these. All right, okay, patient characteristics. The majority of patients were admitted with heart failure. 45% is a medical illness, followed by infection, followed by uh, respiratory failure and ischemic stroke. But the additional factors is the vast majority of patients were admitted in this trial over the age of 75. So think about that as you think about formulary decisions with the drug. 62% had a hypercoagulable state by laboratory determination. Functional class heart failure is 23%, and about 20% were obese or severe varicosities. Here's the data. This is combining the 80 and 40 milligram doses together. So on the left-hand side of each of the next few slides will be the efficacy side. On the right-hand side will be the safety side. What you see by combining these is a 25% relative risk reduction in the, in the um, outcome of VTE or VTE-related death. Number needed to treat, 63. Those of you that understand that number realize that 63 is a very low number. Uh, if you look at major bleeding, essentially there was no difference in major bleeding between the two groups. If we look only at the 80 milligram dose, there was a 32% reduction in relative risk. So this is one of your four questions at the beginning, 32% reduction in relative risk. Again, at the 80 milligram dose, there was no statistically significant or clinically significant difference in bleeding with, between batrexaban and anoxapirin placebo arm. If we look at the 40 milligram dose, it was equivalent, though, to the comparator. There was no statistically significant difference between the 40 milligram and the anoxapirin arm, and there was no statistically significant difference in the rate of bleeding. Okay. Um, on either one of these. And that's either with severe renal impairment or concomitant P glycoprotein use. So what that's telling you is what's driving this trial is really the 80 milligram dose with 160 milligram loading and not the 40 milligram long-term dose. Now, what I wanna call your attention to is the following. No therapy. So this is following the patients from the stoppage of the trial 42 days out to day 75. And what you see is maintenance of a statistically significant drop in the number of VTE events all the way out to day 75 with the use of atrexaban. All right, now let's look at safety. This is combining the 80 milligram and the 40 milligram together. Again, no statistically significant difference in major bleeding. 
but there's a couple of factors I want to point out to you. The first one is when you have a Tmax that's double the rate, double the time that you see with the other DOAX, the dwell time of Batrexaban in the duodenal bulb or in the duodenum or in the gastric mucosa is going to be longer, so it's not a surprise that you're going to see more gastrointestinal bleeding with this drug than you see with some of the, with a comparator such as anoxapirin, which is being given sub-Q. But the rest of the factors, intracranial hemorrhage, interocular, or fatal bleeding were relatively equivalent. CRIM. For those of you that don't know what um, <clears throat> CRIM is, it's defined as clinically relevant non-major bleeding, and it requires some type of medical intervention, although it's not considered to be a major bleed. But what you do see with a long-acting DOAC that's here for with a long, meaning in long-acting half-life, it's not a surprise you're going to see more bleeding, although they, they didn't reach the level of major bleeds with Batrexaban versus what you see with um, the enoxapirin arm. All right, so let me move away from the APEX trial, let you f t think about the data I just showed you. The FDA did approve this drug for, pro for prophylaxis, VTE prophylaxis, extended care VTE prophylaxis. So the next thing is that I want to just give you an idea of if you decide to put this drug on, the, on your formulary, how do you control its use? So let's look at some more set stratification tools and patient-specific factors. There are two really predictive scores. One is the Padua prediction score, and the second one is what's called IMPROVE, or the International Medical Re Prevention Registry for Venus, uh, venous thromboembolism. And then I'll... What I've given you at the bottom is some shared decision-making team-based care, and I will not show you that data for the sake of time, but it, you do have the website to go to if you'd like to look at this further. But let's look at these two um, stratification tools. So this is a 76-year-old man with heart failure, and he is admitted to the ED with a persistent cough, dyspnea, and bilateral edema. He was experiencing restricted mobility and was an unable to get out of bed. He has heart failure functional class 3 with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 29%, hypertension, BPH, and GERD. His current medications are there. As we think about using any of the DOACs, are there any medications on that list for you to think about that would lead to a drug interaction that you need to stop those drugs or that you're not able to use a DOAC? Just so, something for you to think about. Uh, he has an allergy to penicillin and he's a retired teacher, so we applaud him for being a teacher for all those years. <clears throat> if we look at his physical findings, we see all those physical findings suggest he has acute decompensated heart failure and should be admitted to our institution. And then what you see for the rest is no difference, except I would call your attention to the cockcroft gulp calculation of 40 mils per minute. So he is essentially a candidate for almost all of the DOACs that he could be given. So here's how to calculate the two scores. The Padua is on the left, the Improve is on the right. If a patient has heart failure, which he does, you get one point. If he ha is elderly over the age of 70, he gets one point, which he is. Been immobilized for greater than three days, which he had been based on his wife telling the ER the physicians. You get three points for a total score of five, and any score above or equal to four puts this patient at high risk for an in-hospital or post-hospital VTE event. Improve. Improve is simpler to use. Age greater than 60, you get one point, and immobile for seven days, a little bit longer, you get one point, and then anything that's two or greater, you get, uh, you're at high risk of VTE. So you can use these scores to help you, if you'd like, in your formulary decisions about using this drug, putting it on formulary, but controlling its use to patients that are at high risk of a VTE event. <clears throat> so I have a question for you, and that's the following. Patient requires observation in ED for 48 hours for decompensated heart failure, is later transferred to general medical floor and hospitalized for a total of seven days. During his hospitalization, the patient requires supplemental management oxygen to manage his hypoxia, and IV diuretics for volume overload. 
is he a candidate for, perfect, for extended VTE? And if yes, which drug would you pick? Would you pick to start him on anoxaparin, apixaban, vitrexaban, or rivaroxaban? And this is extended VTE prophylaxis over the 35 days, not just in hospital. About 30% of you would still stay with the, the standard therapy of 14 days of anoxaparin. Clearly, that's been the standard for a, long, for a long period of time, and I understand that. About 60% of you, though, would switch to the newer agent with patrexaban. All right, last objective is transitions of care. And transitions of care require complete and accurate exchange of information. Are we as pharmacists good at doing that? I would argue that we are very good at doing that. Number two, care management, medical continuity, and laboratory monitoring. Again, those are things that we do for our drug therapy, and certainly they can be done for transitions of care. And communication between healthcare professionals and the patient and caregivers is obviously a, not an optimal outcome that we have for transition of care, and it takes a team-based approach to do that. But there have been a number of studies that have looked at this. The biggest one to date has been Jackson Memorial Hospital Miami DVT program, where they actually had their pharmacists embedded in the transition of care team from patients that are hospitalized to DVT care outside the hospital. They provided patient education, treatment, and patient follow-up um, and selection. And what they found was they could reduce the length of stay at the hospital side as well as their ED visit time was reduced. So there are certainly studies out there that are showing the fact that pharmacists should and can participate in VTE care, as well as transition of care, and I would encourage you to do so in your institution. So, in summary, in medically ill patients, approximately 60% of VTE, VTE risk accumulates from admission to 40 days. The only current uh, um, FDA-approved indication for VTE prophylaxis is patrexaban, 32% relative risk reduction. But there is an increased risk of bleeding, as we see with every single DOAC that we have. And uh, your, your, my cautionary tool to you is please look for and embed in your formulary decision process to offset any other, set, any other types of bleeding, including medications that can lead to excess bleeding with the use of patrexaban or any DOAC. Thank you very much for your time and attention.